Hello everyone, this is Karen at The Meaning Code and I'm here again with Michael and we have some really interesting things to talk about today of the intersection between radical orthodoxy and the teachings of Jordan Peterson and Tom Holland and uh, Owen Barfield. So <clears throat> um, radical orthodoxy was kind of the brainchild of John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock starting about in the 1990s. And um, John Milbank's book, Theology and Social Theory Beyond Secular Reason, lays out some of the, the main idea there. And it was summarized in really well, in a in really nice way by this um, YouTube video that I was watching that the idea is that modern social and political thought rests on no better or secure foundation than Christian theology. Both are stories about how things are. As such, they stand on the same footing. But Christian theology out narrates modern thought because it has a better and a truer story to tell. And I think that's where the intersection is with Tom Holland. And uh, Catherine Pickstock starts talking about how um, we've lost our way because we've lost the sense of transcendence and that this loss began in the 13th century. So um, it's very interesting to trace the history of that loss of transcendence. And I think that's one of the things that is the overlap with Owen Barfield, because Owen Barfield certainly talked about the loss of participation. And um, so I'm going to let uh, Michael jump in here, because Michael, you found a good summary of the seven points of radical orthodoxy. And as we go through those, I think I can bring up the connections with Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, this is a really large topic, I, I think. And um, I I first found out about radical orthodoxy via um, my conversation with Michael Tatusha mm -hmm. and um, he, his uh, doctoral uh, supervisor on his, um, uh, I guess you would call it, yeah, I guess he said it would, you would call it a thesis over in, um, in England was on Barfield and uh, his, his supervisor was John Milbank, who is, you know, the founder of, of uh, the radical orthodoxy movement. And that, um, reading some of his materials is what first led him to make this, you know, trek over to uh, England to do his, um, his PhD there. And um, there's, there's something. Um, I, so we, we talked about that uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of Farfield, but I, I feel like there's something really broad here in terms of the movement that, um, that I'm, I'm, I kind of just have an intimation of, but uh, I would like to kind of pick at by going through some of the these seven theses of uh, of Milbanks, which is kind of his summarization of the movement. Um, and it is kind of important to point out this is it's not unsurprising if you haven't heard of this, because even if you are somewhat um, you know up to date on theological trends and such, because I think it is it is kind of this whole movement's kind of cl been cloistered in the academic circles, especially overseas in Europe, uh, in, in more Anglican circles. So it's kind of, um, um, in the material, if you, if you reference some of Milbank's work in such, it is very kind of dense material. It's very intellectual, very, uh, scholarly and focused in terms of, um, of who it's, you know, what, it, what its audience is. Um, but I'll, I'll start with the first, uh, theses here and we, we can go from there. And I'm just going to read his whole thing because it's so compressed. Um, so number one thesis he has is, first of all, radical orthodoxy uh, denies that there is a sharp division between reason and faith or reason and revelation and regards any such notion as a modern deviation from earlier views. It believes that human nature can only be fully understood with reference to our supernatural destiny and human knowledge with reference to divine illumination. Um, and for me, this, what rings throughout all these is, is Barfield's concept of participation. Mm -hmm. 
And, and of course, Barfield, I don't, I'm not really sure. I don't know enough about the sort of genealogy or genesis of John Milbank's thought on this. Um, but obviously, I know Barfield's kind of trajectory pretty well. And of course, his, his entree into this way of thinking all comes from his analysis of language and a sort of um, awareness that he gains from that, that language necessarily points to this sort of transcendent reality. Um, that there's, there's a sort of, um, almost sort of message within the language itself that we were able to decode. And that's, that's also seems to be what, what Milbank is pointing at here in terms of that, this this sort of divide we seen in, in the modern world between um, nature and supernature, or I think John would use the terms um, grace in nature. Um, that 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 divides kind of is a modern distinction. That um, um, that in Barfield's way of putting it he would say, even though you can make the distinction in your mind, you haven't really sundered it in reality. Um, and, and what he comes to see is that even though we have this sort of split brain today, um, under underpinning it all is, the, is this unity that in some sense you can't deny unless you want to, to, den to deny uh, any sort of meaning to the language that you use. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which that gets into some of how what we've seen in the wake of postmodernity is, is a sort of uh, tending towards that direction, towards the, the meaninglessness of, of, uh, of words and, and a sort of arbitrariness to them that's, that's only governed by sort of the, you know, um, these sort of power games that, that Jordan Peterson will point to and, and uh, as, as, kind of undergirding the motivations for why uh, people are, are wanting to engage in these sort of uh, uh, deconstructive acts. Well, one of the things I noticed in the narrative of the <clears throat> video I was watching about John Milbank and Catherine Pickstock was that gentleman quoted a guy by the name of Ivan Illich. Have you run across him? I think he's, a, he's a Catholic thinker. Um, I think so. He, and the way Ivan Illich put it was, he said, the world falls from the hands of God into the hands of humanity. And the church begins to look like the state. And when faith is no longer seen as having, um, as inhabiting the same space as reason. Faith and reason undergo a rupture and you end up with an authoritarian religion rather than uh, um, integrated and um, participatory faith. And then you also end up with a thinned down rationalism. And this thinned down rationalism, which we've been observing, right, for the last 50 years, but it's probably been going on for hundreds of years, it just gets more and more and more atomized and that that tends to lead to more and more authoritarian religion. So religion gets more and more unmoored from the actual participation with transcendence. And we end up allowing ourselves to be put kind of under the thumb of the will of God coming down to us as this authoritarian um, governance. So, <clears throat> At that point, faith becomes an act of the will and reason is cut loose to explore the world outside of God. But of course, there is no world outside of God. So, <laughs> so that's kind of pointless. But I wondered if I could just um, play a clip for you from Catherine Pickstock where she talks about this because I thought it was so helpful. Um, let me share a screen here. And here's Catherine Pickstock. Um, I did it again. Sorry, I have when I share screen, I have to put on computer sound, and I forgot to do that. Hold on a second. I 
I will get better at this. No, well, I guess I can't do that. Well, let's see if it works this way anyway. Um, you can see the screen, right? Yep, I can see what you're sharing. Okay, let's it's see if we get to that sound. Catherine Pickstock says, we have lost touch with what she calls transcendence. Transcendence is the word to describe a reality which is beyond all categories. It's, all, it's beyond all dichotomies beyond all understandings of thing that we have so for example where we see a thing as having boundaries as having a place as having a certain kind of temporality transcendence is beyond all of those things it's beyond here and there near and far limit and unlimit or unlimitedness transcendence is simply beyond every definition which isn't to say it's formless or like a big mess um it, it is unity itself but unity conceived as beyond being i think beyond being is perhaps the most useful way of thinking of it although one could also say as plato said of the good that it's unsayable it, it simply can't be reached in words so if you think of reality as a kind of hierarchy for a moment and you put transcendence at the top of the hierarchy and you have on the lower rungs of the hierarchy all forms of reality right down to ants and ants legs and so forth although transcendence according to this picture is right at the top equally it is just as present to the ants legs as it is to the angels and the priests and the bishops and so forth it's both at the top and at the bottom there simply isn't a place where transcendence cannot be because it is transcendent it is beyond all limit and yet works in and through every limit that we have the divine in catherine pickstock's understanding pervades reality and yet exceeds it so um i'll stop there for now and see what you think of that yeah, I think this is very much Barfield because what what she's describing there <clears throat> is a, is is essentially Barfield's idea of polarity, that you have these two things that seem to contradict but actually are not, in that the divine, the transcendent, pervades reality, and yet is beyond it. So it's not you're not you're not stuck in this sort of duality of you either have to pick um, pantheism where, where God is kind of the sum total of nature or the some sort of alternative, like maybe a deistic model where you have a theistic God that's created the world and is, has sort of has the capacity to just walk away from it. Um, but, but instead it's, it's um, God is in and beyond nature. And I, I think, for whatever reason, um, in the, in in our modern and postmodern frames, we 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 have a, a sort of either orness to that that Barfield is speaking to, and that um, you know Pickstock is picking up on in there in her language about transcendence, and also in terms of uh, her writings. Um, I think this is brought up in her book after writing the the middle voice, which is. Uh, is this sort of transjective mode. It's not objective or subjective. It's, it's this middle space that is, is where humans live and operate, which this is where our consciousness is engaged with the world. Yeah, I think one of the phrases that she used that's really important to me is this idea of being beyond limit. Mm -hmm. Now that's, in my mind, that's not the same thing as unlimited. Um, and, and for this, I would like to bring in Jordan Peterson because, um, hold on a second, I'm going to have to. Sure. Yeah, no worries. So I'm going to bring up a video of Jordan Peterson talking about this idea. I mean, to get a clearer picture of what 
what I'm thinking about when I think beyond limit, I want to show you guys this, this video. So we're going to share screen and here is, um, this desktop, I guess. And it's this video. And it's at one forty seven. Here we go. At the, and so, so I was thinking about that, this the center of the world. I was also reading Solzhenitsyn at the same time. And Solzhenitsyn said, mm -hmm. you know, that the world is constituted, and this is, the, this is the, one of the fundamental axioms of Western civilization, is the world is constituted so that each person is a center of the world. Like, literally. But we can't understand this, because we can't understand how something could be constructed so that that could be the case because we're used to things having one center but the universe isn't like that it has multiple centers every conscious being is a center and and a center of of, of infinite scope in some sense you know like bounded but but infinite which is also very difficult to understand and and there's a big difference between being the center of the world and a center of the world so if you remember that you're at center of the world, then you stay sane. But as soon as you start thinking that you're the center of the world, well, then, you know, you're, you're just done. And, and it's not going to be helpful. And like, even if you are doing the best you can, you know, you invite everyone else along. It's like, I'm doing the best I can, but there's way more work to do, man. And, and we're, everybody needs to participate. And everybody's participation, that's the other thing that's so weird about it everybody's participation is vital there isn't anybody that it, it isn't okay for anyone not to be in the game you know and and i don't understand that exactly as well but that also has something to do with our like our being made in the image of god and and the central value and divinity of our consciousness the consciousness that gives rise to being itself these are truths you know these are truths it's consciousness that gives rise to being from 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 possibility and 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 that's us that's what we do and we decide is it going to be better or is it going to be worse and if it's better well that's on you man because you made it a little better and if it's worse that's on you too and that's your destiny every day and that's what gives you your intrinsic value and the and the and the meaning of your life the significance of your life and the effect of you on the structure of reality itself that's all, that's all you. And it's a miracle, you know? And, and, and that is why I believe fully, that's why it says in, the, in Genesis that human beings are made in the image of God. God is what extracts order from chaos, from potential. It's like, I don't, I think that that's, I don't think that can be said in any way that's more true than that. And it's, it's a hell of a thing to contemplate. And especially when you think that you actually believe it, you know, because you do believe that you have intrinsic value. Our whole legal system is predicated on the idea that you have intrinsic value. Even if you're a murderer, even if you're accused of something absolutely heinous, there's still something about you that has value outside of the dictates of the state. And you treat other people like that. You know, if you're going to have a friendship with someone or an intimate relationship or a love for a child or a parent, you treat them as if they have intrinsic and transcendent value it's like well is it true or not and if it's true well maybe it's an it's an, maybe it's an inexhaustible source from which you can draw it's possible it seems so i'm going to stop there when he got to that place where he said it's an inexhaustible source from which you can draw mm -hmm. all of a sudden was thinking about so Catherine Pickstock is talking about the way that transcendence interacts all the time with the whole hierarchy. And that has something to do with us and that yep. inexhaustible source from which we can draw that's coming. It's not coming from me. It's coming right. through me somehow. Right. 
Right. And there's something inside of me as a human being that is beyond limit. Not, not, and I'm not saying that, that God is in me or that I am God or any, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying there's some hole in me that functions as a pathway for God to manifest his glory in the universe, to manifest his grace to others, to manifest his love to others, to manifest his, his thoughts to others. He works through us somehow as his hands and feet, but, but it, it's beyond limit. So I'm not putting it into words very well, but. No, I, th I think you're doing a great job. I don't, I mean, I mean, as Catherine was pointing out in her talk, in, in some sense, this is everything we're, we're, we're trying to, to put into categories here is by its definition uncategorizable. So like there is something here that is ineffable. Um, and and I, I think part of the reason that the moment we're in is requiring us to, in some sense, make the ineffable, to pull it into the language of the day is in some sense because we, we, we have built society such that if something isn't explicit, like we, we, we've lost the ability to communicate, right? So if there's all sorts of implicit things that we've built our society on and, um, but we've, we've been kind of sort of hell bent in modernity to kind of strip those away and have a, have a society that's built just on the explicit stuff. Just let's just negotiate this explicit set of rules and run our society based on that. Um, that seems to me to be part of the, the modern project. And, and so because we've stripped so much of that away, we, we we're, we're being forced to in some sense, craft new sort of jars of clay to put this stuff in to make sure it survives. Cause if we don't, it doesn't, it seems like it's gonna, it's gonna go away is w w what it feels like because we've, we've lost this old participatory way of knowing these things that is, is implicit and gives and puts us in connection with these things. Um, and um, so it's like, it's almost like we're creating maps or attempting to, create maps for future generations to make sure this isn't lost. Um, and I think, you know, part of, part of what Peterson is doing that makes him stand out so much. It, it, it seems like he, he did step into this, this huge vacuum where there was nobody else articulating these things clearly is, is again, this idea of the human as a center of, of the cosmos. That's, and I, I think there's a real truth there that we've in, in especially, you know, Christians should be the stewards of that reality. And we have, we just dropped that ball completely. And it, it, here you have this, this sort of eighth, I, I wouldn't call, you know, I guess people have referred to uh, Peterson as a pagan, which I think is a good thing. He certainly is not within the Christian uh, orthodox mainstream by any stretch, right? He's, he's standing outside that and picking up this and saying, Hey, this is something you guys have forgotten. And, um, and, and, and again, you can't, Barco comes into this because you, you can't make sense of this unless you have this idea of polarity that, you know, that you could be a center of the cosmos, but not the center, right? That, that you could be, um, that there, that reality could be constructed such that there are many centers and that God could be transacting through all these consciousnesses simultaneously, um, which, which doesn't, I, I think part of why, you know, some people can't listen to Jordan because they, they, they listen to a part of it. And it sounds, it sounds like what he's saying is that we are sovereign over God. And so certain Christians listen to him. They're like, Oh, he, he's, he doesn't understand it. But I, I think, I think he's right in that whatever, however reality is going to be shaped in the end, however the story of this existence is going to unfold, we are going to have our fingerprints all over it. Now God is going to write the main plot, but it's going to have, it's going, that plot is going to come into being through our cooperation and participation. And I think he's, he's got his, 
he's you could you could say he's overemphasizing our part of it, right? But I think he's doing that because we've completely dropped the ball on our part of seeing of seeing a vision of of that of that way in which we and our decision making and the consequences of it connect to to the way reality ends up being shaped. Yeah, I think I think that's key. This idea of that there is such a thing as reality. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about this before. What is the structure of reality? That's a real thing. There is a real structure of reality. And uh, Catherine Pickstock was just saying that um, transcendence is a place that goes beyond all the categories, whether the categories are boundaries or place or temporality. And um, I, I've also been listening to some stuff on, um, I guess I was reading some Husserl and phenomenology and looking at this whole idea of space and time. And I had heard something earlier today too about um, I just lost it, but it has to do with this idea of if we let, there's something about the way um, Einstein came up with this idea that space and time are a single unit that is taking us further down this path away from the actual structure of reality. It may very well be that space and time are a, are a fabric, a single unit. But if we think about it that way, then it's like the world flattens out. It's like the, the universe just flattens out and we lose this sense of wholeness. We lose the sense of moving through time. Um, I probably have notes on this someplace. If you give me just a second. Oh, here it is. I guess it was something that um, John Milbank was saying that when you're cut off from God, you imagine everything has its own inner code or operating instructions and you develop a kind of an imminent spatialization, which he describes as things now carry their own meaning rather than seeing meaning as something that we receive as a gift from God. And he says, rather than seeing that eternity is ultimate and that time is the moving image of eternity, which was Plato's idea, time becomes subordinate to a kind of static spatial grid by which everything can be measured. And we will lose the importance of things dying and passing away Instead, we substitute an abstraction. So we no longer look at Britain as full of individuals, or as Jordan Peterson would say, many, many centers of the universe inhabit right. Britain, and each of them is unique. Instead, we, see, we begin to see Britain as the abstract average person, and they're all just chugging along on this machine and the machine never changes from generation to generation because the only purpose of the machine is to increase in wealth and increase in technology and the whole machine is just moving forward and it's it's sacrificing people to the secular state that that's what john milbank was talking about and and then Catherine Pickstock comes in and says, the more the world is known and dominated, which is what the scientists are doing, right? <laughs> Not that they don't have good things to do, but, but it's all about knowing and dominating the world and everything in it. The more that happens, the more the true vitality escapes us. We lose the vitality, the energy, the meaning, the purpose, the individuality, all of that. Yeah, I saw something really interesting the other day um, describing modernity as a sort of, as an attempt 
to see ourselves as living in a story, but that there is no storyteller. Um, and, and so kind of by its definition, it's, it's bound to fail because, you know, we, and, and the, the, the idea of story comes with, with all this idea of, uh, of structure, of, of purpose, of telos, of, of a sort of, um, a shape to reality that we can, of course, from the modern perspective, use for making predictions about what's going to happen next, how things are, you know, all, all of that, um, that we kind of assume we don't realize that deep underneath it is, is a, an assumption, an inheritance from the idea of this storyteller, right? And it, it's still implicit in, in, in a lot of our wording. And even if people start talking about the ways in which uh, different laws function, there is a, we can't help but imbue it with a sense of, uh, of, uh, of this inheritance of this language, like, you know, cause, calling like, you know, why does, why does something fall out of the sky, gravity, you know, it's a scientific law. There's something, there's a, a command, there's a structure that's there that things are following. Um, and then, you know, postmodernity kind of comes along and goes, just basically points out the obvious that, hey, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, you, and, 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 and so, but then, but then once you point out that, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it's almost like, uh, you know, what is it? Like the, the cartoons where the guy runs off the end of the, uh, of the cliff and he's still for a while, he's still running and doesn't know he's, he's in midair. Yeah. And then somebody points it out to him and he falls. Uh -huh. That's kind of like what post modernity does. It kind of says, Hey, you know, you're kind of out there in the middle of nothing. And then once, once we kind of see that we, we, we now have this moment where there's, we're we're in a kind of free fall of sorts right now. Um, you you can see so much that's kind of just unraveling, um, and and um, it seems to have uh, no end in sight. Now I think you know certain postmodern modernists play the game sort of cynically, and they pick arbitrary points to stop the deconstructing process. Whether it's you know some sort of political thing that they care about or uh you know it's the usual suspects of like race and gender and all these things that become kind of these stop gaps for what will be foundational and what won't we de deconstruct but the problem is that theoretically if if you're committed to this sort of rational perspective the, the deconstruction the deconstructing can go on forever you know um and you can you can use the logic of, of deconstruction to deconstruct logic itself, which is which is why you can have arguments about you know two plus two equals five and, and such, and why that's an actual sort of uh, rallying cry on the internet, depending on which side of the line you stand on. Um, it's I don't know. It's it's um. And again, all of, I think a lot of this is all, it's all pointing back to a sense in which we, we, we've lost the ability to, to, to straddle the line and see that there's, there's a truth on each side and integrate those truths. Um, you know, in, in, there's a sort of perversity in our time where, you know, even just listening to uh, what Jordan was just saying there, right? He, he's trying to take all these pains to say, I'm saying X but I'm also saying why too at the same time, hear me clearly. I'm saying both together, but, but in this world we live in now, the way we interact with stuff like that is we listen to part of it and we stop listening. And then we say, Jordan Peterson says X. And like, there's just not, I don't know what you would call it. But it, it maybe the, maybe the, the best description would be, there's not the attention span even to listen to something. We think we, we have something when we just have X, we can now build our, our, uh, our polemic, you know, by just listening to that. Um, and we don't, um, we can't take the other side. I, th I think it's a loss of, um, the concept of 
there being an actual truth. Because what we have right now is my truth and your truth. We have right. the truth of right. the evangelical church. We have the truth of the progressive church. We have the truth of the Orthodox church. We have, or we have the truth, beyond, you know, on the atheist side, they have their truth and we have our truth. And so we're using this word truth in a very squishy way, right? But, but if there is an actual truth, then... We believe in truth. We don't believe... The, the key word there is universal truth, right? Okay, and, and, I, and, I, I guess I can go with that. But I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is, and I, I came to this conclusion probably 40 years ago when I was reading a book about Chinese characters. And I could see that buried inside these Chinese characters were deep biblical truths. That means that even inside the Chinese culture, which back when these characters were developed was not by any means what you would call a Christian culture, there were these deep truths that had gone with the language when the languages were divided at Babel. Every people group that emigrated out from there took with them the truth that they had of God, even though their truth had already been corrupted by their own selfishness. But they took that corrupted truth with them and pieces of that truth shows up in languages all around the world. So you're going to find truth inside Buddhism. You're going to find truth inside Islam. You're going to find truth inside a lot of different places. You're going to find truth inside some historical presentations and some truth inside other history. There's pieces of truth everywhere because truth is what it is, no matter where you find it. But you have to know that there actually is a truth in order to identify those pieces of truth and put them back together again. Just because there's a piece of truth inside Islam doesn't mean that all of Islam is true, but there are things inside of it that are true. And we've lost that sense. And that's why when we hear somebody speaking, we just shut out everything they're saying because I have the truth and you don't, so I don't have to listen to you. Instead of, I mean, I like what Jordan Peterson always says, listen patiently and carefully. There may be something that you can learn from what the other person is saying, right? Yeah. Because there's some truth in what they're going to say, and you need to be able to hear that truth and assess it. But it's right. being, it's being, um, knowledgeable enough, or it's being conversant enough with what the truth is. So you recognize it when you see it, you know, it's like, yeah. well, yeah. It, it's also a certain, you know, charitable disposition too. I mean, I think again, we're, we're predisposed to, you know, color the world black and white, right? There's good people and bad people. I'm obviously one of the good people. And, you know, I'm kind of sussing out listening to your words to say, is Karen one of the good people or the bad people? Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is, as we all know, we're all a mix. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but, but the advantage is, you know, if, if I am trying to color the world in such a way that it's sort of black and white, if you say anything wrong, I now can say, Hey, I don't have to listen to anything Karen tells me because she said this, this wrong thing. So clearly she's flawed. Clearly she's morally dubious. Clearly we can't trust the words of Karen. And, and the problem is we could do that for literally everyone. So in a sense, it, it, it frees me up to, to not look and find, those nuggets of truth that are coming at us from so many different directions and every interaction with every individual, we can kind of just shield it all out and be like, you know, no, those, these people are all moral degenerates and I only have to listen to uh, these, these people within my own little echo bubble. But then what happens inside your own little echo bubble is you discover, wait a minute, they're not quite as orthodox inside their bubble as I am and pretty soon you're standing all by yourself and you've got nobody that you can trust and I guess that's when you become the center of the universe because you've more unmoored yourself from everybody else right yeah and that's when you go insane because what are you going to anchor to then after that 
yeah it seems it seems like that's where we're being pushed towards by many many forces simultaneously well so i know we have to close off pretty quick here and i just wanted to share with you something that um that i thought about when i was going through this Jordan Peterson video. And I've also been talking with a physicist about this idea of choice and free will, um, the axiom of choice in the mathematical sense, and trying to determine how that connects up with um, free will and how it might connect up with the beginnings of life on Earth. It's a, it's a pretty big topic. <laughs> But I was thinking about um, the verse Jeremiah 5.22, which is one of my favorite life verses that the same idea shows up many times in the Old Testament. Here's a kind of a paraphrase. The Lord has made the sand a boundary for the sea. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. So I was looking at the commentary in Barnes's notes on the Bible and Barnes made, these, made this comment, a wave which would shatter rocks falls powerless upon the sand. They cannot prevail. But that's a counterpoint to Jeremiah 3, 5, where he says, you could prevail. The waves, regardless of their boundless power, cannot prevail to overcome the boundary of the sand. But you, as a human being, you could prevail. The sea, the mightiest of God's works, cannot prevail, cannot break God's laws. God has made that sand a boundary for the sea, so the sea cannot break God's laws because he has not endowed it with free will. Man on the other hand, even though he is physically impotent, can prevail because being made in God's image, he is free. And this ties right back to the section that I had you listen to where Jordan Peterson says, we are made in the image of God. God is what extracts order from potential. You have intrinsic value. You have transcendental value you have an inexhaustible source from which you can draw. So um, somehow in God's infinite wisdom, he has put this inexhaustible source inside human beings that allows us to prevail in situations where even the mighty power of the ocean cannot prevail. And that's true even in our own lives, you know, when the waves come crashing in on you, no matter how horrendous they are, they cannot prevail because God has made a boundary. Yeah. And I, he gave me that verse when I was going through the, the deaths of my parents and the loss of my husband to divorce all within a month. Um, those were mighty crashing waves, but they could not prevail because God had put a boundary there to protect me. And, um, but not only has he put a boundary there to protect us, he has also put inside of us the strength to prevail in that situation. So it's worth contemplating what there is about sand as a boundary, what there is about sand, because I think we have much to learn there about what it means to have free will and what it means to be um, have this this infinite source from which we can draw yeah well and when you said you we said this infinite source you said god placed it there and i think that's that's one perspective on it but I, even more so i think what did he place there well it is it is that he himself is there yes yes yeah okay. right you're and right so it's and, and so it, there is a but but even the perspective you just gave there was it shows our, our, our kind of saturation is sort of modernist perspective where the storyteller is away from it and he's kind of you know if he's involved he's kind of puppet 
you know, playing the puppeteer mm -hmm. versus this is a very different view where creation is both in God and he's beyond it. But, but the reason we are all a center of the universe is because there is some unique participation of the divine in, in our conscious expressions at all time. Um, that he is in some sense with us in our suffering and, um, and there's, there's something, there, there, there is an enablement there that he's an always on invitation to, to cooperate and participate with, with what he's doing and seeing. And, and I think in some sense, we, we never can not be participating, even, even when we are choosing to do evil and which is why in some sense the evil we do is so is so awful in some sense because it, it does have this it's undergirded by by um divine power in some sense um even though and 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 we um and, and that's why you, you can see this sort of diabolical things humans have done to each other there's a certain there's a certain um, nastiness to it that you don't see in the animal kingdom um, that which only we as humans is able to achieve. And, and I think that's partially because um, we have extra resources to draw upon. Well, and it, and as Peterson always said, we, we know what it takes to hurt us. So we know what it takes to hurt others because of consciousness, because we have consciousness. But back to the storyteller thing, um, you know, in Hebrews, it says that Jesus is not only the author, but he is also the perfecter of our faith. So, so he's the author of our story, but he's also the perfecter of our story. So fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. Um, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. So, as the author and protect, perfecter of our faith, he is transcendent at the top of the hierarchy, but also always working throughout the hierarchy. Yeah. Maybe that's a good place to wind up because I know you have a hard stop. So, um, we got through number one. There's only six more points. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can do one each time we get together. Yeah, maybe we can do uh, more of these short uh, interludes where we go through one thing and, and kind of use that as our locus. Sounds really good. Have a great day. You too, Karen. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye.